It is very good to be here. One of the last times I was on this platform was when I was taking Susie Bersinger as my lawfully wedded wife. Susie, as you know, uh, taught for many years at Valley Press School on this premise here at Valley Press Church. And I want to apologize uh, to you for stealing one of your Presbyterians. Uh, that was to get back at Calvin for marrying a former Anabaptist. And now for 22 years, Susie has been living uh, in Baptistville, which is uh, the closest thing to the millennial kingdom that you can have on this side of the second coming. I know you at Valley Press think that you are in the millennium, and, uh, and you may be. I want to tell you that. Anyway, it is a wonderful thing to be with you. And on a serious note, I want to thank you for, uh, for the prayers that you have offered up on my behalf. As many of you know, for the last two and a half years, I have been discovered with cancer. It may have been in existence before that time, but I didn't know it until about March of 2015. It started my colorectal area, and uh, it had metastasized to my liver and lungs which means that it's a fairly serious situation. And yet God has been good. And I have to testify to you uh, that the greatest medication that I have received um, is the good news of the gospel. That God has so loved the world that he has given his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I told the congregation uh, when I first had the cancer that the big C is not cancer in my colon, but condemnation for my crimes. And that's been handled by a bigger C, which is Christ and his cross. And I have found that an even better medicine than chemotherapy is the good news of the gospel. And that we can face our death whenever death will come because we trust in his death, the death of our Savior who stood in our place as our great substitute. And so I want to commend to you the good news of the gospel. Um, whenever you think that uh, doctrine does not matter, uh, don't wait till you get cancer to find out that it really does. Um, what upholds us in the difficult times is to know on the one hand that God is absolutely sovereign, that as R.C. Sproul said, there is no maverick molecule in the universe. And on the other hand, that Jesus Christ has paid the penalty for our sins. And those two twin truths, the sovereignty of God and the salvation of Christ, have been like Aaron and her holding up my arms during these past two and a half years. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you at Valley Presbyterian Church for the prayers that you have made on um, our behalf. And uh, I do trust that uh, uh, by those uh, prayers being answered, uh, God will give many, many years in fruitful service to his cause and to his kingdom. And thank you, Ron, for this invitation to come and be with you. It is always a family reunion to come back to Valley Press and to open up the word uh, before you. And I'm glad for this opportunity. I would ask you to take your Bibles and to turn to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. You have no doubt had longer uh, passages of scripture as the basis for uh, previous sermons. This will be one of the shorter passages. It's not even one verse. It's uh, just a half a verse in verse 25 of Romans chapter 16. I'll read the passage, have a word of prayer, and we will launch into it together. Romans chapter 16, verse 25, where Paul says, Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for this great privilege that you have given to us to uh, worship your name. And we have spoken to you in our songs, in our confession. Um, as we have made um, our affirmation of faith, we have um, indeed again spoken to you. And now we would ask that you would speak to us, that you would cause us to open our ears and that you would open our wills and hearts and minds to the things of the Holy Scriptures. Lord, we recognize that we are in need of that Savior that we have already sung about. We pray that you would once again renew your forgiveness to us for the sake 
of his great sacrificial work at Calvary's cross. And we'll give you our praise and our thanks. Fill us now with your spirit. May what I say be helpful to my brothers and sisters here at Valley Presbyterian Church. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. With great thanks. Amen. About two blocks from where Susie and I live uh, is El Segundo High School. And about five years ago, there was a construction project that was begun at the high school. It began in the summer, and it was the uh, renovation of the football field. And though it began in the summer, it did not end in the summer, but it carried throughout, throughout the school year, in fact, the entirety of the school year, which meant that football games and pep rallies and track meets and homecomings all had to either be canceled or moved to another location. And I remember walking by the high school one day, I think it was in the evening, when I saw a sign that was posted up, a sign either for the workers or for the administration, probably for the administration uh, to read, and the sign went exactly like this, or at least close to it, thank you for the senior year I never had. Now, before we dismiss that statement as the immature outburst of an 18-year-old kid, we need to realize that the disappointment which is expressed there carries over into adulthood and is experienced all throughout our lives, from jobs to health to marriages to children to not being able to take vacations to the vacations we have taken, uh, disappointment in the sense that the expectations we've had for life are not matched by the experiences that we've received in life is simply part and parcel of the very fabric of our existence. William Willimon, who was the former chaplain at Duke University, wrote these words, our seminarians, he said, complain that upon graduation from seminary they are overwhelmed by the gap between the church they expected and the church they got. Now, switch out seminarians for people and church for life, and suddenly this statement becomes a universal one. All of us are overwhelmed by the gap between the life we expected and the life we received. And therefore, this morning, I want to talk with you about how to deal with disappointment. And I want to do so by laying out and setting forth two foundational truths. So I'll give you my outline right from the start. When we face disappointment, we need to say to ourselves, one, I deserve much worse than this, and therefore I shouldn't complain. And two, I receive much more than this, and therefore I needn't complain. So you have my two points. One, I deserve much worse than this, and therefore I shouldn't complain. And secondly, I've received much more than this, and therefore I needn't complain. Let's take each of those two statements one at a time. First of all, I deserve much worse than this, and therefore I shouldn't complain. You do realize, don't you, that each one of us deserves hell. And that therefore everything short of that is mercy. If you don't believe that, then you're on a different planet than biblical Christianity. Let me illustrate that for you by giving you one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors. Uh, John Flavel is a 17th century Puritan who lived approximately the same time as John Bunyan, the writer of Pilgrim's Progress. And, and Flavel wrote a marvelous little book that was... Uh, later entitled, Keeping the Heart. By the way, I just want to say something about Flavel. Um, if you've not read Flavel, you need to read Flavel. You need to correct that error in your life. <laughs> and one book that I would recommend that you read is this one. A little short book. Wonderful book. Based upon the words of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, where the writer says, My son, keep your heart 
with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. And what Flavel does in that treatise is to tell us exactly how it is that we ought to keep our heart. Because our hearts are like little boats on the tempestuous sea. And at times, those boats are raised up. And other times, they are troughed down. Because at times, the waves lift us high. And when the waves lift us high and things are going swimmingly for us, then our hearts tend to become complacent and proud and arrogant. And at times when the opposite is the case, when the waves recede, in fact, go down into the depths of the ocean, our hearts are not complacent and proud and arrogant, but they are despondent and despairing. And what Flavel does is to tell us how to keep our hearts from arrogance when things are going well, from despair when things are not going so well. And what he does is he argues in all of those circumstances. He has a number of situations that we find ourselves in. The first is the times of prosperity, and the second is the times of adversity. And he gives all kinds of arguments why your heart should not despair, should not be downcast, should not be downhearted when you go through difficult times. And he marshals these arguments till he comes to the last one. And this is my favorite, and I want to read it for you. Um, you'll find it as an insert in your bulletin. I understand that it took a little less than an act of Congress to get uh, the uh, insert into your bulletin. I would not try to uh, experiment with this at home. Um, you have to be a, uh, a cousin with cancer in order to get this passed. So uh, please, don't uh, try to replicate what I have tried to do. But I want to read to you uh, this great quote from Flavel, where he says, if your heart still refuses to be comforted, after all of the arguments I've given you, if your heart still refuses to be comforted, then do one thing more. Compare the condition you are now in and with which you are so much dissatisfied, your job, your marriage, your kids, your health, your cancer. Compare that condition with the condition which others are and in which you deserve to be. And this is what you should say to yourself. That's why he puts it in quotes. Others, you should say to yourself, are roaring in flames, howling under the scourge of vengeance. And among them, I deserve to be. Oh, my soul as you talk to yourself, is this hell? Is this marriage? Is this health? Are these kids? Is this job hell? Is my condition as bad as that of the damned? What would thousands now in hell give to exchange conditions with me? And then he gives this marvelous illustration. I have read, says an author, that when the Duke of Condé, I think Condé is a city or a section of France, so when the Duke of Condé had voluntarily subjected himself to the inconveniences of poverty, in other words, he took on some kind of monastic vow of poverty and uh, chastity and obedience or something to that effect, when he took on the inconveniences of poverty, he was one day observed and pitied by a lord of Italy who from tenderness wished him to be more careful of his person. In other words, this Duke of Italy sees the Duke of Condé and he says, you know, be careful about not going too far with your vows of poverty or however um, he had uh, put himself into these inconveniences. The good duke answered, sir, be not troubled. And think not that I suffer from want, for I send a harbinger before me who makes ready my lodgings and takes care that I be royally entertained. I need to stop there. We don't use that word. We don't have that person. But a harbinger back in the day was a person who was attached to a very rich individual. And before the rich individual entered into a town, he would send this person called the harbinger to prepare his lodgings, to make sure that the room was swept and the food was hot and the bath water was drawn and the bed was made and everything was great so that when he came in, he would have no problem. Now, you have to be a duke or a lord to have that kind of person. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to... Wouldn't it be great to have a harbinger in your life? It'd be great. 
I have a harbinger. I, I married her. I stole her from you. But anyway. Uh, so, I mean, and, that, and the Duke of Italy is, you know, is, the Lord of Italy is, is hardened for that. Maybe this, this vow of poverty hasn't gone too far as he feared because he says, don't be worried about my situation. Um, don't be troubled and think not that I suffer from want for I send a harbinger before me who makes ready my lodgings and takes care that I be royally entertained. The Lord asked him, who was his harbinger? And get this answer. He answered, the knowledge of myself and the consideration of what I deserve for my sins, which is eternal torment. When with this knowledge I arrive at my lodging, however unprepared I find it, methinks it is much better than I deserve. Isn't that marvelous? Why does the living man complain? Thus the heart, says Flavel, in conclusion, may be kept from desponding or repining under adversity. Now that's brilliant. The harbinger was not a man. The harbinger was a memory, a remembrance of what he deserved for his sins. And therefore, when he came to his lodging, if the lodging was not up to snuff, if the food was not fully cooked, if the bath water was not drawn, if the bed was not made, if the room was not swept, he said to himself, I deserve much worse than this. This six motel is not the best, but it's better than hell itself, which is where I deserve to be and where I am not. And I think that we need to get this into our systems. The first act we must perform, I think, especially as Americans, is to relinquish all claims, all so-called entitlements. We live in an age in which we feel so entitled, and we need to rid ourselves of that kind of thinking. Uh, Jean Twangy, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University, wrote a book with an interesting title. The title of her book was Generation Me, and the subtitle is Why Today's Young Americans Are More Confident, Assertive, Entitled, and More Miserable Than Ever Before. In his screw tape letters, in which C.S. Lewis imagines the correspondence from the senior demon screw tape to his nephew Wormwood, screw tape advises Wormwood on how to make his client miserable. This is my second quotation in your insert. And here are these words, brilliant words from Lewis. Men, he said, are not angered by mere misfortune. In other words, they're not angered by the fact that someone cuts them off on the freeway, per se. Men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury. I don't deserve to be cut off on the freeway. You have this, this, this understanding of entitlement. When I get in the 405, I don't deserve this. And then that causes you to feel angered. So men are not angered by mere misfortune, but by misfortune conceived as injury. And the sense of injury depends on the feeling that a legitimate claim has been denied. The more claims on life, therefore, that your patient can be induced to make, the more often he will feel injured and, as a result, ill-tempered. I remember I was some years ago in an elevator, and there was a woman in the elevator that was going down with me to the first floor. And as we were about to leave, I, I, I said, have a good day. And her response was, I deserve it. Well, she didn't deserve it. And as I thought about it later, I thought, what a poor situation that woman is in. Because if she goes off into the world with that sense of deserving, then she's going to be a very difficult person to get along with. She's going to get on the 405 and get cut off. And, you know, it's not going to be easy for the person who cut her off. She's going to go home and the... Kids are not have, you know, have, have made the room and the meal is not fully cooked and all the things that were expected were not done. That would be a very difficult person to live with. I would not wish to be married to a person who has that attitude. And I hope that you don't. I hope that you don't. We need to say to ourselves, I've received, I deserve much worse than this. Not I deserve it. And therefore, I shouldn't complain. 
rather than have a sense of entitlement. But there's a flip side to all of this, and this is my second point, and it's a positive one. And it's found in the second statement, which is equally true. And that second statement is, I've received much more than this, and therefore I needn't complain. I'm sure that if Bill Gates misplaces a $5 bill, he doesn't lose a lot of sleep over it. Why? Well, because he's, he knows just how fabulously rich he is. And yet his wealth is nothing, nothing compared to the Christians. And this is, I think, where our verse comes in. I'm sure at this point your pastor has been wondering when I'm going to get to my text. Well, I'm getting to it right now. Paul says, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel. It's in the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ has come into this world, has taken on flesh, and then as if that were not enough, would take on our faults. That he who was eternally God would take on our skin in his incarnation, and then our sin in his crucifixion. It's that good news where our truest treasures are revealed. And therefore, it's by reminding ourselves of that gospel every day that we are reminded just how wealthy we really are. That's why Paul says here that the gospel establishes us. The gospel strengthens us. Paul has opened, if you remember, his letter to the Romans with that great statement of the gospel in chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And just as he opened Romans with a statement of the gospel, so he closes the book with a statement of the gospel. So the letter, you see, is bookended by statements regarding the gospel but each time with a different emphasis. In chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says that the gospel saves us. In chapter 16, verse 25, he says that the gospel stabilizes us. In chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel emancipates us. In chapter 16, verse 25, the gospel establishes us. In chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel liberates us legally. In chapter 16, verse 25, the gospel levels us emotionally. In chapter 1, verse 16, the gospel enables us to face God. In chapter 16, verse 25, the gospel enables us to face life. Calvin put it so well when he said, and this is my third quote, we see that our whole salvation and all of its parts are contained in Christ. We should therefore take care not to derive the least portion of it from anywhere else. If we seek salvation, it is of him. If we seek strength, it lies in his dominion. If purity, in his conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth. If we seek redemption, it lies in his passion. If remission of the curse, in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification, in his blood. If reconciliation, in his descent into hell. If mortification of the flesh, in his tomb. If newness of life, in his resurrection. If inheritance of the heavenly kingdom in his entrance into heaven. In short, since rich store of every kind of good abounds in him, let us drink our fill from this fountain and from no other. Now that, I think, is how to cultivate contentment. I deserve nothing. Therefore, I should not complain. I've received everything. And therefore, I need not complain. And if I could be autobiographical just for a moment, those two statements that I've just given to you have been life jackets for me. The cancer has not been easy. There's been surgery and pain and uh, difficult nights and difficult days. But it's not hell. I deserve much worse. 
I do. And, and on top of that, not only is there a hell that I've escaped, but there is forgiveness and pardon and adoption and justification and reconciliation with the living God and the grand prospect of eternal life with him. I deserve nothing, and therefore I should not complain. I have received everything, and therefore I need not complain. We need to bookend our lives, sisters and brothers, with those two truths. Contentment is achieved by remembering the hell we've escaped and the heaven we've inherited, the damnation we haven't gotten, and the deliverance that we have. So back to our El Segundo High School student. If he or she had been firmly grounded in the gospel, that person could have walked by that construction site and said, you know, this kind of stinks, but I'm not going to hell, and I am going to heaven. And who really cares about a football game anyway? Therefore, I ask you, are you solidly and securely grounded in the gospel? Can you say with Paul, now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel, are you solidly and securely grounded in that message? If you aren't, then you are a sitting duck for every setback that comes your way. But if you are, then you can say in the words of Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The marriage may be bad, the pay may be low, the bills may be high, the health may be poor, but there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Indeed, you can say in the words of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. One more word. I ask you, have you been freed from that coming wrath? Have you been given those untold riches? You may be in the pew today, but you're not in Christ. You may have come to Valley Presbyterian Church for many years, or you are a newcomer to this congregation, this good congregation. And I want to tell you that all of this can be yours. This heaven this forgiveness, this pardon, this peace with God, this peace of God, all of this can be yours. And you don't have to pay a dime because it was all paid for those who put their faith and trust in the Savior that God has provided. And I give you the good news of the gospel that 2,000 years ago, the living God stepped from his throne, laid aside his glory, and his splendor and came to this earth. The greatest event in human history was not in 1969 when Neil Armstrong set his foot upon the moon, but rather 2,000 years ago when God set his foot upon the earth. And we ask ourselves, why would God do that? Well, God did that to do something absolutely astonishing. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world in order to take the punishment to receive the penalty, to serve the sentence, to absorb the guilt of all who have put their faith and trust in him. Because all of us have disobeyed God. And because of our disobedience, we deserve to be eternally separated from God forever in a dreadful place called hell. But God did not want us to be separated from him. And so he sent his son who willingly came to go to a cross and stand in the place of all of those who put their faith in him. Oh, Put your faith in him this day. Trust in him. Come to him and say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And I believe that you died upon the cross and you took the punishment for my sins. And I call upon you to be my savior and I crown you as my Lord. You see the ABCs? Admit, believe, call, and crown. Do those three and mean those sincerely. And I want to tell you that life everlasting will be instantly yours that you will be forgiven of all your crimes and put right with the living God. And then you can face life 
with all the curveballs it throws at you. Indeed, you can exclaim in the words, in the final words of this handout, have I been freed from wrath deserved and given wealth untold, then I will call complaints absurd in light of what I hold. Amen. Let us pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Drive these truths upon our hearts and lives this day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.